We're in a series entitled Maintaining a Spirit-Filled Life. Say this with me. Say maintaining a spirit-filled life. And on last week, we covered our second lesson where we taught about the benefits of speaking in tongues. And then after the, 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 the message, we helped those to manifest tongues in their lives who desired to. And we had a lot of people who came down to the altar and were filled with the Holy Spirit. Let's give those who came down a big hand clap of encouragement. Now, let me say to those who came down on last week that your experience of being filled with the Holy Spirit started here, but it didn't end here. Amen. For those of you who may not have spoken in tongues when you came, I want you to continue on your own time to seek God, begin to spend some quiet time with him in praise and in worship, and begin to thank him for the manifestation of tongues showing up in your life, and it will just be a matter of time. As a matter of fact, I want you to go back and watch last week's sermon on the YouTube or listen to it on the podcast, and then for additional teaching, say additional teaching, for additional teaching, go to the website, click on messages, put in the search column the word tongues. And when you do that, four lessons on speaking in tongues will come up. And everybody who has gone to the website and listened to each sermon in chronicle order were speaking in tongues by the end of the last one. Amen. So I want you to do that. Now today I want to continue in the series on maintaining a spirit-filled life. One member on last week uh, told me that after hearing last week's message, even though they already speak in tongues, they said they were encouraged to speak in tongues more. And I said to them, that's the purpose of hearing the word. The word should motivate us. Everybody say the word should motivate us. Now, I'm about to say something very strong, so just touch your neighbor and say, he's about to say something very strong. If your prayer life or your spirit manifestation life while being in this series hasn't changed, then maybe you're just a hearer of the word. Now, touch your neighbor and say, he might be talking to you. Now, look back at them and say, but he's talking to you, though. So if you're taking notes, today's message title is Manifesting the Father's Spirit. Manifesting the Father's Spirit. And the goal of the message today is to explain the different manifestations of the Holy Spirit and how you and I can use them in our daily lives. So if you have your Bibles, turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 1 Corinthians 12, and then we're going to turn over to Matthew chapter 17 verses 24. That was 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and then Matthew chapter 17 starting in verse 24. Now, what we have learned over the last two weeks is that speaking in tongues is not a gift. I'm going to say that again. What we have learned over the last two weeks is that speaking in tongues is not a gift, but the gift is the Holy Spirit. And so that's what we have declared. And so we read in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, it said, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, or the gift of the Holy Spirit. So the gift is the Holy Spirit. He goes on to say, For the promises is unto you and unto your children, and unto all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God, God shall call. So when you and I receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, it gives us the ability to manifest His abilities. I'm going to say that one more time. When you get saved and you make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, the Holy Spirit is going to come on the inside of you. And when the Holy Spirit comes, he gives you and I the ability to manifest his abilities. So these manifestations of the Holy Spirit are listed in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. But today we're going to start in verse 7. Now here's what we're going to do today. I'm not just going to tell you 
about the different manifestations. I'm going to walk you through, explain to you what each of them mean and which, what each of them does, and then I'm going to give you some scripture references in how it worked in Bible lives, and then I'm going to give you some practical ways where it has worked in my life. So in verse 7, it says, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one or for whosoever is given by the Spirit, here's the first one, the word of knowledge. To another, the word, I mean the word of wisdom. To another, the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. Verse 9. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit. I notice, notice he keeps saying by the same Spirit. That's good because the Holy Spirit is that Spirit. Verse 10. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. But all of these, all of these manifestations work that one and the self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as that man wills. So let's look at the first one that we just read that was listed. And that is the word of wisdom. Say the word of wisdom. And the word of wisdom is interesting because the Greek word for this word uh, wisdom is, th- is our English word Sophia. So if your name is Sophia, then your name means wisdom. And uh, this word of wisdom, what it is, it's knowledge of human or divine things. It's human or divine things. And it's a great example of us using because It covers both worlds. In other words, a word of wisdom can come when it comes to spiritual things, but a word of wisdom can also come in natural things. And a great example of this manifestation, the word of wisdom, happened in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what I'm going to do is point out when it happened to Jesus, because a lot of times when we read the Bible, we don't read it with a mindset of the whole entire context of the Bible. So in Matthew chapter 17, we're about to read a story, and you will probably know the story, but you never connected the story of this particular manifestation of wisdom operating through Jesus Christ. So watch this. Matthew 17, look at verse 24. And when they were coming to Capernaum, they that received tribute or tax money came to Peter and said, Does not your master pay taxes? He said, well, yes. And when he was coming to the house, Jesus prevented him saying, hey, what are you thinking about, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take customs from or taxes from or tribute of their own children or of strangers? Now, this is interesting because Jesus never, Peter never said anything to Jesus. Jesus, uh, Peter had this conversation with someone else on the outside. So here we go. We got now discernment working in Jesus right now because he knows what Peter is thinking. So watch what happens. Verse uh, 26. Peter said unto him of strangers. Jesus said unto him, then the children are free. He says, notwithstanding, lest we should offend them. Watch this. Here's where the word of wisdom comes in. He says, go to the sea, cast the hook, and take up the fish that comes up first. And when you have opened his mouth, you will find a piece of money. That, take it and give it unto them for me and you. Everybody say that's words of wisdom. In other words, these individuals were expecting Jesus and Peter to pay taxes. Well, Jesus didn't have money on him at that point because Judas was not with him. Judas was the one that kept the bag with the offerings in it. And he was not with Jesus and Peter. So Jesus told Peter, listen, go down to the lake, go fishing. Peter knew how to do that because he was a fisherman. He says, now the first fish that you pull out, open up its mouth, and it's going to have enough money to pay you and I's taxes. See, the word of wisdom is designed to help you fix problems that you don't have the natural wisdom to fix. Amen. Amen. And if you notice, he went fishing and found money in the fish's mouth. Now, you know, if I was Peter, I would have been like money in a fish mouth. 
And see, that's what keeps most people from operating in these manifestations because you allow your brain to control your thinking. You don't allow your spirit to control your thinking. You allow your brain to control your thinking. When you allow your brain to control your thinking, then you will analyze yourself out of obeying God and manifesting these manifestations. Amen. Everybody say words of wisdom. Words of wisdom. See, years ago, and some of you all know this story, but we have so many new people that come to our church. Years ago, when I was single, I had a car that my parents gave me in high school. It was a Nova. It was, uh, I drove it in high school, I drove it in college, and then I drove it when I finished college. And so this Nova was interesting because it was a 74 Nova, but I, so I drove it for a good 15 years. Well, how many know that after 15 years, you're going to start kind of dying, you know? And so this, color, this car was a rolling Rubik's Cube because it was many colors. It was like Joseph's coat of many colors. And... Uh, you know, I, I'm not mechanically inclined by nature, and so I needed new windshield wipers one time, so I took off the old ones, and when I put the new ones on, I didn't put it on correctly, so my windshield wiper actually went beyond my windshield. So if you were sitting next to me at a red light, my, my windshield wiper might hit your car. So there were issues with this car, no big deal. Well, one day I locked my keys in the car. And I needed to be somewhere. And back in the day, you know, you had two keys that control your car. See, now they give you one key and, and, and it fits everything. Well, it wasn't like that. You had a square key for the ignition and a round key for your trunk and your door. How many remember that? Let me see your hand if you remember that. You over 40. That's why you remember that. So anyway, I had locked my keys in the car, and I couldn't get them out, and I was staying with a lady named Miss Johnson. She was like my grandmother, and the Lord, I was like, Lord, what do I do? What do I do? He said, go in the house and get Miss Johnson's keys. So I went in the house. I said, Miss Johnson, can I use your keys? She was like, yeah. I'm glad she didn't ask me why, because at that point, I didn't know what I was going to do with them. I get back outside. I was like, oh, Lord, what, what do you want me to do with these keys? And so I just took her round key, because she had a Chevrolet. So... I had a Nova. She had a Chevrolet station wagon with the wood on the side. So I tried to use her door key to open my door. It didn't work. Then I tried her round key to open up my trunk. It didn't work. So now I'm looking like a fool. I'm saying, Lord, what is going on? He says, now I want you to take her ignition key, take it and stick it in your trunk, and open your trunk. And when your trunk opens, push your back seat back, and then open your door. I get back there, and I, I stuck that square key. In my trunk, bloop, the car, the trunk opens. I'm in shock. I push the seat back. I get my, you know, I unlock the car. I get my keys. And then on my way back inside, because I'm like, like floored, because that was like amazing. But then I'm like, I wonder where that work again. So I, I closed all the doors. I kept my keys this time, though. I closed that same trunk. I took that same key. I stuck it in the trunk, and it would not open. God don't need to do miracles for your fun. I'm like, hey, you'll you be telling your whole neighborhood, hey, come on my house, let me show you something. God doesn't produce miracles for your amazement. So I thought, see, the word of wisdom told me what to do. Now, I was preaching at my pastor's church years ago, and I was telling this story in the midst of a whole lot of teenagers. It was a youth conference, and so one of the youth camp workers who drove the church van had locked the keys in the church van. So he got outside and realized, I locked the keys in the van. So he was like, well, let me find somebody else with a van on the parking lot. And so he found somebody. He says, uh, excuse me, can I borrow your keys? They said, what for? He said, well, Pastor Edmund said that the Lord told him to go get somebody's keys, so I'm just asking for your keys because I locked my keys in the van. So they was like, well, I want to go with you and see if it works. So he got a whole trail of people walking behind him. He gets their van key, sticks it in the van, and the, the wisdom the Lord gave him was to wiggle the key just a little bit and bloop. Somebody else's van key, open up their van. See, the word of wisdom will work for you if you will work it. That's right. yeah. All right, let's, let's go to the second manifestation. It's found in verse number 8. It says, For to one, or whosoever is given by the Spirit, 
the word of wisdom to another, watch this, the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. Now, words of knowledge is supernaturally knowing something, whether it's natural or spiritual, that only God would know about the situation, about the person, or about the circumstance. I'm going to say that again. Words of wisdom is supernaturally knowing something, whether it's natural or spiritual, that only God would know about the circumstance, the person, or the situation. And so you may know this story, but you may not have ever tied what was going on in this story to the manifestation of the word of knowledge. So this is the woman that was at the well. Jesus was talking to this woman. He asked her for some water. She said to him, okay, well, uh, you asked me for something to drink. I'm a woman of Samaria. So let's pick it up in verse 10. Jesus answered and said unto her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was who said to you, give me a drink, then you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said unto him, sir, you do not have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. From whence has you thou that living water? Verse 12, are you greater than our father Jacob which gave us the well and drank here himself, his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, whosoever drinks of this water, everybody say this water. This water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirst. But the water that I will give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Verse 15, the woman says, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst again. Jesus said to her, watch this. Now here's where the word of knowledge is coming in now. Go call your husband and tell him to come here. Verse 17. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said unto her, here's the words of knowledge. You have well said that you have no husband, for you have had five husbands. And who you are with right now is not even your husband. How many know that shocked that woman? How would Jesus know she had been married five times? The word of knowledge came to him. And he said to this woman, you've been married five times and and the man you shacking up with right now is not even your husband. So watch her response. This is good. The woman answered and said, I perceive that you are a prophet. I would have think so. Watch this. That word of knowledge impacted this woman so much. That if you read now in verse 28, it said, The woman left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, I, I'm just assuming she went to all the men she was, used to be married to, because it didn't say she went to the women. She went to the men, verse 29. She said, Come see a man which told me all the things that I have ever done. Is not this the Christ? Watch verse 30. Then they went out the city and they came to him. And if you keep reading, the Bible says they didn't believe because of what they heard themselves. Here's what I want you to see. Notice that the word of knowledge to this woman changed her life and the life of other people. Do you notice too that Jesus didn't use this word of knowledge to condemn this woman? Come on now. Listen, all of these manifestations are designed to build people up, not to tear people down. Amen. So, uh, what's interesting is I have received words of knowledge all the time from for people in this church, people outside of this church. In fact, years ago, say years ago. Years ago, I used to go to church with a retired, he's retired now, a retired Dallas Cowboy football player. His name was Larry Brown. Larry played for the Cowboys back in the day. This is when Emmett and all of them were playing. And uh, they had laid off Larry. Uh, mid-season. And Larry and I were talking one mid, mid, mid-week mid Bible study night. We were talking, and the word of knowledge came to me. I said, Larry, I said, the Dallas Cowboys are going to call you back this week. I said, and they're going to ask you to come back and play for them. Now, you got to understand, that doesn't happen in the, in the football arena. Typically, when they lay you off like that, you gone. But guess what happened? Just like I said it, 
Larry got a call that week from the Dallas Cowboys. They asked him to come back and play a position. Someone had gotten injured, and he was the best player that they knew that could cover that position. Not only did the Dallas Cowboys make it to the Super Bowl that year, guess who the MVP of the Super Bowl was? Larry Brown. How would I have known that they were going to call him back? Everybody say, that's the word of knowledge. Listen, God wants you to manifest these manifestations in your everyday life. And it's not just for you. It's for people around you. Can I get an amen from the church? The third manifestation that is listed in verse 9 says to another, watch this, faith by the same spirit. Now, in Acts chapter 14, verse 8, this manifestation of faith shows up. It says, and there sat a certain man of Lystria. He was crippled in his feet, being crippled from his mother's womb, who had never walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him and perceiving, watch this, that he had faith to be healed. See, that's why you got to sit under the word because the word, you may not know that day is your day of deliverance. This guy's sitting down. He had never walked before in his life. He hears Paul preaching the word. And Paul looked up and perceived that this man had faith to be healed. He looked up. He said, stand up on your feet. And the Bible says he leaped and he walked. Everybody say, that's faith. See, I'm talking about faith beyond your faith now. I'm talking about the faith of God, the faith that Jesus said that you can speak to this mountain and tell it to be removed. I'm not talking about normal faith. I'm not talking about human faith. I'm talking about divine faith. I'm talking about the kind of faith that will help you overcome something that would never have been overcome had it not been for your faith. Everybody say years ago. Years ago, uh, eight or nine years ago now, uh, uh, my wife and I were moving from the house that we started our church in. So we started the church there, and so the whole, everybody was at the house, you know, um, and everybody. We had praise and worship practice there, intercessory prayer there, true group training there, the band practice there, everything was there. And so uh, we lost a lot of privacy. So, you know, and then the, the office, the admin office was there until my neighborhood kicked me out. So uh, the Lord had told me to move, and I wasn't already ready to move, you know, because I, we hadn't even found somewhere to move to. But I'll never forget, he said, Evan, I want y'all to move. And, and so uh, after a serious security breach, which, you know, if you don't know what's going on in a person's life, don't talk about them. Say amen to that. Uh, and so uh, we had a serious security breach. It was, it was bad. And uh, he had told me to move, and I hadn't done it, so... So I, I, I talked to our realtor. I say, hey, uh, just, just put a sign in the yard. Well, a sign in the yard is no good unless the, the, your house is on MLS. In other words, people might see it's up for sale, but when they call and say, hey, there's a house here. They go, well, there's no house listed. So it wasn't listed for a long time. And one of the reasons it wasn't listed is because I was not ready to make sure my house was like spick and span clean and a carpet with all the rugs marked just right. I wasn't ready for that. Because you have to make sure the house is clean when someone wants to see it. Well, long story short, we put it on the market, and we found a house that we liked. Okay? And so at the time, the house that we liked, they only wanted 10% down, and we could get the house. No big deal. We had saved up some money, and so we had our 10% down, and then with the money from the house sale and just, you know, all that. So that was all good. So the house sold. We moved into a hotel. Our new house, we were closed in about, I don't know, two weeks or whatever. When we moved, the economy flipped. And now they didn't want 10%. They wanted 20%. Well, I don't know about you. That's like tithing twice. 20%? I didn't have the other 10%. So now we're at this hotel, and I'm like, Lord, you done got me out here. You the one told me to move. I was kind of okay where I was at, Lord. You told me to move. I say, so what are we going to do here? So some weeks went by, and then a month go by, and then a month and a half go by. And being in a hotel room with two kids is not fun. Very little intimacy takes place in situations like that. 
So I don't know where this 20% coming from. And I said, Lord, I don't know what to do. And so I started getting frustrated. Then I started getting anxious. Then I started, like, getting, you know, not totally depressed, but I was, like, down, like, bad down. I mean, I, I don't hardly get down, but I got so down, I told my wife, I was like, babe, I don't know what's going to happen. And she saw that I was down. She was like, oh, my God, I've never seen him like this. And so she was like, you need to go listen to your pastor because my pastor was going to be in town that week speaking at a conference. She said, you need to go listen to him. I said, I don't feel like listening to him. Because, you know, when you're having a pity party, you just want to have one by yourself. So she said, well, what would you tell your members to do? You would tell them to go and sit at church and listen to you. Ain't you going to tell them that? Yeah. So I made some phone calls and got down there. And so I was there. And I walked in discouraged, no lie, discouraged. I sat there and I listened to my pastor preach. And the stories he's, he told, I already knew them. See, sometimes we waiting to hear something new. We don't need something new sometimes. We need something old. Man, I'm telling you what, because see, the word is always fresh. So I'm listening to him, and while he's preaching that word, faith is coming. The Bible says faith comes by hearing, and hearing what? When I was sitting there, and then all of a sudden, I, I'm telling you, I could almost physically feel it. But boom, faith hit me. And I left there. I came in discouraged, but I left there encouraged. I knew that this situation was going to get solved. I didn't have no answers. Nothing had changed. My situation hadn't changed. But guess who had changed? I had changed. Faith had come inside of my heart. So I got home. I told my wife, I said, babe, listen, this thing's going to work out. I don't know how. So the next day, I had a family meeting. I don't know if heaven or you old enough to remember. We had a family meeting. She remembers. So I sat down there, but I said, listen, I said, I know it was God's will for mommy and daddy to get married. I said, I know it was God's will. For mommy and daddy to have you in Landon. I said, I know it's God's will for us to have started Word of Truth Family Church. And I said, just like I know all that, that that was God's will, it is God's will for us to move into that house. I said, now, I don't have the answer right now on how we're going to get in it. I said, but all we're going to do is just continue and stay in faith. And so that's what we did. And so remember now, and here's, a, here's some, some keys. When you're standing in faith, there are five things you should expect. Here's the first thing, is that you should expect God to give you a plan of action. And if a plan of action doesn't come, number two, then you're going to get some wisdom from God. If wisdom from God doesn't come, then you're going to wait for some favor from God. And if favor doesn't come, then you're going to wait for a miracle from God. And then if you don't see none of those four things happen, then you're going to get strength to endure until change comes. So I was waiting on those five things, one of those five to happen, and all of a sudden, a plan of action came. I did some research and found out the person who was selling me the house was on his last leg. He was behind on that house. So I called him and see, normally you don't talk to the buyers, sellers of the house. You don't do that. You talk to them through the realtor. I got his number. I called him. Here's a plan of action. I said, hey, man, I know you're having a hard time, but I'm here to help you if you'll let me. And so I talked to him. To, I said, just let me lease the house. And, uh, and by that time, my financing will be done. Now, see, some of y'all be like, well, I wouldn't say that because I wouldn't know all that. No, no, see, no, no, when you have faith inside, circumstances don't matter. And I talked that guy to let me lease that house. Because, see, what he did not know is that anywhere my feet gets is mine. So I knew if I leased it, <laughs> I was going to own it. So he let us lease that thing. And so when we got in it, moved in and did everything, then watch this, a word of wisdom came. All of a sudden, God said, Eben, he gave me the name of one person. He said, call this person and they'll give you the other 10% you need. I said, really? He said, they will. So, you know, I didn't want to call them because I didn't, I didn't want to face rejection. So I text them. <laughs> will you give me, you know, I explained the situation to them. And, uh, and I asked them. And I said, I need this much money. You know, will you help me? They text back and said, of course I'll help you. When do you need the money? You need it right now? You want it in cash? You want me to wire? You want a cashier check? I said, I don't know what I need right now, but I'll tell you when I need it. 
we closed on that house. Watch this. Due to faith working, the wisdom of God working, everybody give the Lord a hand clap for that right there. So what are some practical ways you and I can begin these manifestations in our everyday life? Because if it doesn't work in your everyday life, you don't need it. This is bigger than church. Touch your neighbor and say, this is bigger than church. So how do you and I manifest the Spirit of God in our everyday life? Here's some practical things you can do. Here's the first thing. And here's the problem I believe most people have. Most people feel like their life has to be perfect in order for God to use them like that. Listen, God doesn't need a perfect person to manifest the Spirit of God. He only needed one perfect person, and that person's name is Jesus Christ. So listen, no, I know your life ain't together. Mine ain't either. No, no, nobody's perfect. You ought to know I'm not perfect. You can just listen to me and know I'm not perfect. Come on, if you listen to me long enough, and if you say, well, you don't listen, you sound perfect, just keep listening. Keep listening. <laughs> so don't let the devil tell you, well, you got to have a perfect life to, to get these manifestations in your life. Pastor Edmund is perfect, so that's why. No, 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 no. There's only one perfect person, and that's Jesus. So watch this. Imperfection is the exception when it comes to the manifestation of the Spirit. Imperfection is the exception. In other words, imperfection is normal when it comes to manifesting these. So what you're going to do practically, you're going to wake up every morning and acknowledge God as your Lord, and you're going to yield your life, your heart, your mind, and your mouth to him. Lord, I thank you this morning for waking me up today. And Father, I yield my mind, my heart, my mouth to you right now in Jesus' name. And then the next step, what you're going to do is that you're going to keep a confessed heart before God. We all mess up. And so 1 John 9 says if we confess our sin, he is faithful to, and just to, watch this, forgive us for our sins. Most of us know about that part. But then the next part says, but he also cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Don't just ask and receive forgiveness. Take a bloodbath too. See, the bloodbath will keep your conscience from condemning you. The Bible says that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So that cleansing that he's talking about, you get cleansed with the blood. Take a bloodbath. So here's my whole thing. When you mess up, fess up. I said, when you mess up, fess up, because you're going to mess up. Look at your neighbor and say, you're going to mess up. Now look at them again and say, you done already done it. <laughs> As you keep a confessed life, it keeps you sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Watch this. Here's the next one. Say to the Holy Spirit every morning, say to the Holy Spirit, whatever you want to use me to say or do today, I am willing. Whatever you want to use me to say or do, I am willing. And then ask him to give you word, a word or a manifestation for somebody. Ask him. Holy Spirit, give me a word of wisdom. Give me a word of knowledge. Give me something that would encourage somebody. And when the prompting comes, if you're not sure it's the Holy Spirit, then ask him to confirm it. In other words, you're sitting there, and you know your coworker is going through some things, and all of a sudden the Spirit of God gives you a, a word of knowledge that their son just ran away last night. And you say, oh, Lord, is that you? Is that you? And it comes back up. Yep, they, he's hurt. their son ran away last night. And so, you know, now you're like, oh, no. Oh, I don't know if I want to say something. What if I'm wrong? Well, what if you're wrong? So let me show you how to do this. So you go to your coworker and say, you know what? You've been on my heart. Can I pray for you right now? Nobody resists prayer. You can ask a Muslim to pray for them, and they will let you. So you say, hey, can I pray for you? And you say, yeah. And so you just start praying for them. Father, I just thank you for Susie. 
I thank you, Father, that you put her on my heart to pray for her. And so I pray for her right now in Jesus' name. And, Father, whatever stresses that she's going through in her life, let her know, Father, that the peace of God is available for her. And, Father, whatever's going on in her family, and then you just stop and look at it and say, you know, I feel that I need to pray for your son. Do you have a son? Yes. You know, I just feel that your son ran away. Did he run away? He ran away last night, girl. Ah! 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 Okay, let me finish praying now. Because then you feel all spiritual, like, yes, look at that, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge. I am the man of God, the man of God, the woman of God. Now, if you miss him and you ask, do you have a son? She says, no. They say, well, let me just keep praying for you then. If you miss him, just remember what that voice sounded like next time and don't listen to it. See, let me practically show you how to practice the presence for the manifestation. How many have to get on elevators? You ever have to, have to get on elevators? Yeah, yeah. So this is how I do it. I tell my kids, this is how you practice. You get in front of an elevator. It's got like three or four doors. And you push the, door, the button and you say, Holy Spirit, which, which door is going to open? And you wait for them to tell you. It's going to be the one down on the end. And then if the one over here opens, you didn't hear the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you get back at the elevator the next time. Push the button. Holy Spirit, which one is going to be? You listen real good. Listen real good. Okay, it's going to be the one in the middle. And the one in the middle opens up. It was the Holy Spirit. Well, just recognize that voice. But you got to practice. It's easy to practice. Practice makes perfect. So you wonder how I've gotten this bowl with it. Because, see, when I know, when it come on me, I don't care what you say. And what's, let me tell you something. I had a couple. I looked at them. I said, are y'all pregnant? Well, no, Pastor, we're not pregnant. Next time I saw them, Pastor, we're pregnant. Because I saw it before they did. And so they said, Pastor, you know what? We, we didn't know we were pregnant when we saw you last time. But, yeah, we're pregnant now. I said, so do y'all have twins? Uh, twins? Oh, no, no. Come back next time. Pastor, we're we pregnant with twins. Because, see, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, these manifestations are designed to uplift and encourage people. And guess what? You are a representative of Jesus Christ. He's waiting on you to allow these manifestations to flow so that he can be a blessing in people's lives. Did you get something this morning? Give a hand clap if you did. God bless you.